great. That was a delicious lunch and a delicious cheesecake, not to be rude to the rest of you, but it was delicious. Um, so again, I am Robin DeRosa and uh, was speaking earlier this morning for folks who weren't here. I've had a great day so far. It's been a pleasure to be here. Um, but I think this will probably be a real highlight for folks. So I'm honored to be moderating this panel, which hopefully means you will not hear very much from me at all. So that's my goal in moderation. And I have heard a little bit about what's, what's coming from, from these folks, so I think it'll be wonderful. This is our uh, student panel, and so we've started with a prompt, which is asking these students to talk to us about an engaging learning experience that they've had so we can bring the student perspective uh, into the event. Some of you may have heard uh, groups of students at one of the panels earlier, which was really wonderful this morning as well. So they're gonna each take about five minutes to tell their engaging learning stories. Um, and then from there, we'll talk for just a few minutes and then open it up for questions. So one thing that I would be really grateful for is that as you're listening to them, maybe think a little bit about what you might wanna ask later so that we can have a really fruitful conversation uh, with, our, with our participants. Um, so I've asked each panelist to start by introducing themselves, tell us a little bit about what they're studying, and then tell their engaging learning stories. So we'll go from there. Hi. Um, so my name is Macy, and I'm a recent graduate from um, OCAD University's Strategic Foresight and Innovation Program as a Master of Design program. Um, and my journey to that, um, to design, is actually pretty convoluted. I was in fine arts before, and I was working in the museum sector, and then I decided to become a lawyer to help artists, and I became a lawyer, and then I wasn't feeling like I was very fulfilled um, in that role, and then I turned to design, uh, design processes um, to look at social issues and um, how that could be applied um, in in law and in any other field. So, um, in terms of sharing uh, moments of learning engagement, um, I've been in school for so many years, um, but I thought I might be able to share maybe three small instances of life learnings, kind of key nuggets of things that professors or mentors have shared with me that have been pretty instrumental to my very convoluted journey. Um, so the first one, it was, I remember distinctly in the first year of law school, um, and coming from an arts background, it was a very different culture shift. Um, so I was coming from a very open environment to a more um, rigid, um, very competitive environment. And in first year, you're basically um, deers with, with headlights on and you really don't know what to do or you're just following the path which is um, going the corporate route, getting that job on Bay Street. And I remember distinctly the first class um, in first year, a professor who have since become very close to me, um, said the first thing she said was, um, don't forget to think about alternative careers. And um, more importantly, she followed that by saying, um, my door is always open uh, for you to talk to me about that specifically. And um, that was, very comforting to know that what I was feeling and coming from a different background, it was normal not to, um, be, to be thinking about something outside of just one track. Um, and so that really helped me to think about, to kind of justify my own feelings um, and my own values and thinking, okay, maybe the corporate route is not for me. Um, the second instance that I wanna share is um, I was at a, ver at a juncture in my life where I became a lawyer and I was working um, in a cubicle, drafting decisions every day, and I just wasn't, I was, I was feeling very disconnected and I knew I wanted to explore something else and um, design has already been in my mind. Um, this was also um, a time in the federal government where innovation was just um, seeping into that system and so I was very curious about that, and um, I decided to talk to um, several people who I know um, about potentially uh, looking into design as a new direction that could amalgamate um, my past interests um, and experiences. 
And one thing that really stuck in my mind um, that a mentor said to me was, think about your decisions as designing your own life. Um, and that for me has pretty much shaped um, what has come after um, my decision to kind of veer away from law um, or the practice of law and do something different. Um, and then, so that's when I decided to actually um, take a big risk and take a leap and quit my job as a lawyer and go back to school um, at OCAD and um, take, take on this new challenge of um, strategic foresight. And from there, I have learned so much because um, particularly this program is very multidisciplinary. So it really emphasize, um, there's a huge emphasis on bringing together um, people from diverse backgrounds. Um, so we have accountants, we have engineers, we have um, lawyers in the classroom. And um, probably I've learned more from my peers than from any of the professors. Um, so there, there was this kind of leveling of the hierarchy between um, the relationship um, between student and professor. And, um, and particularly also, I've learned a lot about meaningful collaboration or how can you make collaboration meaningful? How do you um, have open dialogue about what skill sets each person bring to the table and use it to the best advantage of the project or um, the learning experience? And as well, just to learn from the design process itself um, when working on a project or um, trying to develop something. Um, and the last piece of nugget that I'm gonna share is something another professor has mentioned um, is that you shouldn't give the work too much respect. Um, so in the design proce process, um, there's a big emphasis on failing fast, but failing better each time. And so um, drawing from that, um, I come from a background where I, I tend to have this perfectionist um, tendency, um, but being in design and being emerged in that process has really taught me to um, not be afraid of making mistakes, but the most important thing is learning from them and making an even better version of that going onwards. Um, so I think that's probably five minutes. Um, but yeah, so those are three little pieces of learning engagement. Hello, uh, my name is Tumela Mashavani. Uh, I came in a few days ago from the Great White North, uh, Thunder Bay. I'm from Lakehead University. Uh, I'm a grad student uh, studying electrical and computer engineering. Uh, and what I'm really gonna share today it's not necessarily an engaging experience, but it was more of an eye-opening experience uh, that I had and I'm still going through. And it all started uh, last year when I started my studies. Um, I took on a course that was outside of my faculty. It was in forestry. Uh, it's called Remote Sensing Systems, for if anybody wants to know. So it, it deals a lot with analyzing uh, terrestrial images that are shot from by, we're using satellites from up in space. And we, the students have to use different tools to, to do their, their analysis and there's a lot of information they should know obviously. Um, so I took that course and, and I really liked it. It was, it was challenging, but it, it was okay. Most of the students, we, we did well. Uh, and then came the winter and I went back to do my engineering courses, but I, I liked it so much and I enjoyed spending time with the professor who was given the course that I still kept in touch after. Uh, and we would meet from time to time and discuss different things. And I remember this, uh, I think it was around maybe February or March, having a chat with him, he told me, you know, I got some feedback from another professor who teaches applied geometrics, which is similar to remote sensing. So the students have remote sensing and with those concepts, they apply them to the other course. And then he said to me, he said, uh, I'm, I'm getting this feedback that, you know, the students don't seem prepared. And this, this brings a question to mind. He said, he said, did I teach it well or was there something wrong here? You know, I, I look at the results and the students have passed. 
And I said, well, I don't know. I'm not a teacher, but sure. <laughs> I, <laughs> I let him vent and I listened. Uh, and during the summer, we spent some more time together, uh, him doing his research and just sharing knowledge with me. And then he told me, he said, you know what? This, this fall, I want to do it differently. We're going to try to do teach the students the same course uh, in a different manner. And I said, okay, fine. Um, and then he asked me to be his TA, and I said, I'll be happy to do that. So I helped him structure a new structure for the course. So the course takes 12 weeks. So we designed it in a way that in those 12 weeks, we would have 10 assignments. We would remove all midterms, all finals. So it's 10 assignments. Nine are the actual assignments, and one is a term project. And all these assignments were designed more at focusing on s particular skills. So for a student to actually get a good grade on the assignment, that means the student has been able to apply those skills, not just learn them or just read in a book and then regurgitate it in a midterm, right? So it's still ongoing because it's still the fall, but th this made me think a lot because Teaching is something that has existed for hundreds and hundreds of years. And teaching methods keep changing with conferences like these and discussions and research groups. But then sometimes it's kind of special when you sit down and say, why are we teaching the students the way we're teaching them? Are they really just getting the grades or are they getting the skills? And that's something that kind of stuck in my mind through this experience. and. From time to time, we go and we sit down together looking at the assignments and seeing how the students are applying the knowledge. And it's really eye-opening in, in many different ways. Uh, one of the assignments we did together, which was one of my favorites, was, uh, was of the Fort McMurray fire that took place in Alberta a couple of years ago. Uh, and one of the biggest problems that they had there at the time of the fire is there was so much smoke, they couldn't go out and help people. So a skill that we were trying to work on in this lab for the students was, are students able to maybe filter out objects that can help people, uh, probably like the responders, get to where the survivors are? And this is a skill that is not just good to know, but it can be applied in real life, and obviously for applied geomedics. So we hope the students that go into the winter that have had this different way of learning would probably be better prepared for not just the course, but also for real life applications. Uh, that's my piece. Good afternoon, my name is Karen Ngo. I am a strategic designer, and I recently graduated from OCAD University's industrial design program. I previously worked with the FXD lab last year on the Free Learning Project, and I'm excited to be back here at TESS and share a student perspective. My most engaging learning experience was probably also my most painful learning experience. It's, it was a course, it was a final program requirement called Systems Thinking. I dreaded this class. Projects focused on manufactured physical goods and their systems, but I knew I was more interested in services and their systems. So what do students do when they dread something? They procrastinate. So I dropped the course twice, <laughs> and I hoped that each time it was offered, the projects would be different, and unfortunately they weren't. So I signed up for the class for a section taught by a professor that I knew specialized in service design in other courses. On the first day, I spoke to him about all my dread and Luckily, he was open to different interpretations of the project. The catch was I had to make sure it met the learning outcomes of the course. There began four months of excruciating, self-inflicted torture. <laughs> I had to rewrite 11 projects that would somehow holistically add up into one four-month-long service design project without even knowing what service design was. Um, I couldn't expect my professor to rewrite all of his slideshows, uh, so I found a bunch of textbooks and tried to absorb as much as I could. I rewrote the projects, trying to translate the old deliverables into relevant ones for me. 
Then I had to reach out to a potential client and then actually do the project and then present the work every week and justify it all, hoping that it was the equivalent of what the course uh, was expecting us to do. Did I miss almost every deadline? Yes. Uh, did I fail? Almost, it sure felt like it. Did my professor suggest two months in, when I was really struggling, that I should revert back to the old projects? Yes. And did I? No. <laughs> How dare he suggest that? So what did this all result in? Well, a fantastic project. I learned how to define, plan, and scope my own project and work with a level of independence that I never had before as a student, which made it so much easier for me when I went on to do my thesis. I was also offered a job that following summer from the client that I based my project off of. The course now also uses my project as an example or template for students that use it, uh, for students to use it if they want to pursue a service design approach. So what made this experience different? Well, a lot of things, some being that I was given a choice and I was making decisions for myself. I was taking a chance and co-creating the curriculum and I felt like I had a responsibility to prove that it could actually happen. Um, knowing that the project was you know, more relevant to my future career goals helped pull me through. And I get it. I'm sure many of you in the room are thinking, you know, it's fantastic engaging learning experience but it wouldn't work in my context, in my classroom, uh, for many reasons. You know, one being that I was the only person trying to rewrite the projects in my class, um, and that was probably a handful for my professor, but imagine hundreds of parents, probably a nightmare. Um, you know, unfeasible, unrealistic, and who here's thinking that? Nod your heads, you know. You know and that, the fact that it's unfeasible, or seemingly unfeasible, is in itself demonstrates that our traditional education system um, poses a huge problem. It's limiting and results in passive learning most of the time. Beyond feasibility, I want to highlight the power of questions. In that course, I had many, maybe too many questions. And with them, I took huge strides. Um, I hope with each of us sharing our learning experiences, you leave not thinking that these are outliers and that it's unfeasible but you are thinking that you know, it's possible and leave asking yourself, how can we make it feasible for our students? And you know, how can we make learners feel something? Have them form an opinion and more importantly, flip it back to them and ask, you know, how can we provoke learners to ask questions themselves and foster an environment where we can use those questions and propel our learning further and explore on our own? Thank you. I'm like pretty emotional right now because that was amazing. Um, are you are you guys recording this? Yeah. I mean, really, we should get this out in the world because um, that was brilliant and amazing. So I'm going to start with just one question that I'll ask, and feel free you can all chime in or not. Um, and then I'm going to ask you guys to feel free to ask what you want. And I'll just remind you that their names and um, contact information is there, but that means you can also address them by name if you've got a specific question for somebody on the panel. But I'm going to start by saying, you know, we're here sort of loosely engaged with the topic of technology. So I might just ask you to talk a little bit about that term, whether you feel like you have a definition of that term that you think might be surprising or different um, than what the, the way that it's normally used or the way people here might be using it or an experience that you want to talk about specifically related to technology um, for people who are interested in, in what you see as the role of technology in your, um, in your learning. Is it on? Oh, yeah. Uh, technology, it can be seen in multiple ways. Um, for example, the story that I just sh I just shared with everybody, uh, we see we see technology in the in the electronic way when using the tools that we use, but also we can look at technology as strategies that we use, uh, different implementations of it. As the world changes, uh, there are things that are being taught today that weren't taught 50 years ago, 
and one way of advancing using the word technology is having new strategies to teach that is technology in its in a different way just wearing a different i don't know suit right uh, that's how i see it yeah in line with that too um I also think it's more important to think of technology just outside of the digital realm. And for me, technology is really um, just a tool and it can be um, a process. Um, so for example, I think the design process can be treated as a form of technology. Um, so yeah, I see it as um, an aid, a support, a tool to um, achieve some sort of goal. I think technology in education, it'd probably be better just to call it tools. I think technology, there's an implied um, understanding that it's digital and electronic, and then there's a huge focus on you know, emerging technology and then trying to fit it within the context of a classroom instead of thinking about the classroom and the learning experience and what tools we could use and create to suit the learning experience in itself. Um, but in general, I think there is a lot of technology out there um, right now that we can really look forward to in terms of you know, um, AI. Like, if you imagine Siri and Alexa not being that, but like teach, like, hey, teach. And like you're debating and arguing. And I don't know, that's a new form of assessment or something, right? <laughs> I don't know, that's exciting for me. Or the fact that it could just provide more engagement among students and bring the world a little closer with the use of the internet. I think it's really exciting. Uh, one, one thing that I just wanted to add, I had a lot of interesting conversations with different people here. Um, and something that I found very common with everybody that I would share my interests with or and they would discuss with me was how uh, some people well, a lot of us, you know yourselves, um, they see they see it the same way that I kind of have seen it, which is that uh, technology is uh, education is always trying to catch up to the technology, whereas they because they create the technology and then education comes in after, like okay, um, what do we have to learn now? What do we have to adapt now? Uh, and it would be an amazing way to look at it if education was creating its own tools, its own technology, um, and not look at technology as this commercial thing, but more of something that is a tool that is available for everybody, and we just have to find a way to implement it in our realm, and not just wait for somebody to make something and then catch up. Yeah, um, I guess in line with that, so it's, it's thinking about like the human-centered user-centered design. Um, and also just, I think it's important to emphasize that we should question emerging technology and really have conversations about that and think about um, where those ideas are coming from, what kind of power structures are devi defining like the design of that and how do we um, change that or um, reshape that or mold technology in a way that would be most inclusive and most useful to the end user, really. I mean, I just can't think there's anybody in this room who hasn't been told, you know, we just got sold these amazing new whiteboards and now you need to, or um, smart boards, right? Now you need to figure out how, to, how come they're important to your teaching. <laughs> and you're like, they weren't important to my teaching. Um, that's brilliant stuff. Uh, we're gonna open it up for questions. I don't know because we're being recorded. Do you, are there more mics or shall I? Okay, yes, so we've got our runners there, our red-shirted runners. Um, so maybe just put your hand up if you've got a question for our panel. Hello, thank you for joining us. You've added so much to this conference, thank you. Um, so I teach online, I teach face-to-face -face and Sometimes I teach practically face-to-face, -face, except there's a big screen in front of the face of the student that I'm teaching in the form of a desktop computer. How, my question is, how important is a physical face-to-face -face relationship with your fellow classmates or your instructor to you, and can you explain? I 
think that there it's really important you can get a different sort of relationship with your classmates by seeing their face and their expression and hearing their voice. Um, but at the very least, what I think is important in an online classroom setting is having a discussion, right? Like you have Coursera and uh, all these different sorts of online platforms where you can learn, but it's very one-sided. So at the very least, that there, there has to be discussion. But for me personally, I always think that being able to see um, you know, my classmates and my teacher's face and hearing their voices and feeling like I'm building that relationship with them makes the learning experience more valuable for me. I, I actually had my first online course uh, this year and it, it was very difficult for me to navigate initially. Um, I would always go to the professor's office and just, could I just talk to you? And he said, well, you're supposed to put it in the discussion group because other students could have the same question and it would just help everybody. I was like, okay, uh, with time I kind of figured it out. Um, but the face-to-face the, the -face is good, but it's not essential. The thing that I found was very important was getting meaningful, meaningful feedback because that's, what, that's the reason why I kept going back to him. He would tell me, or he would put the grade that, I don't know, I got an 80% or 70% and he'll write a line there of, of why. Uh, but it wasn't meaningful. It really didn't get me thinking. And I think that's the important thing. Yeah, I think um, similar comments as um, both of them here. Um, I think the main thing is how do you have um, meaningful interaction? Um, and it could still be um, through a screen, but I think it's just having dedicated quality time to um, I, whether it's have feedback or have discussion. Um, so, and it goes on also in terms of collaboration too. I think a lot of us now do a lot of remote work, um, but it just really depends on the nature of what it is. Um, so maybe there could be dedicated time set aside where students get together to work on something in person. Um, so I think it, it depends on the context a little bit. Hi there. The next question is from over here, behind the podium. Uh, I went to your, some of your talks earlier on your experiences at the design lab. And a question I wanted to ask you then is, now that you've looked at the world and researched the world as a designer would, would look at it and research it, how has that changed how you look at either the world in general or education specifically? through this designer's eye. Yeah, th that's pretty awesome uh, in the sense that <laughs> I, I had a talk uh, a, few days, uh, a few days ago with one of my professors. Uh, I said to him, uh, I'm an engineer. From my undergrad and my grad studies, I've, from my master's, I've been focused in engineering. Is it possible for me to divert and do something in education for postdoctoral? And he said, well, we'd have to discuss it. Uh, and th the reason why I started thinking of this is because from this experience, I've started to look at things differently. Uh, I look at the flaws and the gaps that I feel could be improved. And sometimes I feel it's not because of my instructor. No, it's just the way, um, it's just the flow that has been placed. It's the way that they're saying we should learn. and. Uh, uh, it's changed because I've done more critical thinking when I see design processes. I have thought a little bit more about um, about how the message is getting transmitted and what really is the the outcome that I want from it. Um, yeah, it, it's completely changed the way we see things. Well, for me anyway. <laughs> I think f um, it's definitely made me more curious about people in general and just paying more attention to um, observing and listening um, and putting the time in doing that and being mindful of that. Um, and I guess also I came from kind of a rigid career where there's, I mean law, it, there, there's like the gray in between two, but there's also like black letter law and you're trying to fit things into a certain framework. Um, 
And I think design has really allowed me to open up my mindset a lot um, and just to really question everything around me. And um, it also speaks to kind of the applicability of the design process to basically any area, any field. Um, yeah. I studied design for the last six years, and unfortunately, I can't turn off my design lens. Uh, I, I'm sure my friends around me that aren't designers think that I'm a pessimist when I'm walking through the streets and going through Young and Dundas and asking, oh my god, my experience is awful. It's so bright. Why is H&M so bright, right? <laughs> so I can't stop thinking about how things can be improving a user's experience. And uh, when, it, when it comes to education and technology, it's frustrating for me because I'm thinking, okay, is it feasible? You know, is this business opportunity here? Like, is there a desire here? Okay, there is, it is, it makes sense. Like, why aren't we doing it? Like, it just makes sense. Why isn't it happening? And then that's, I'm like, I'm here, sitting here, and I'm like, okay, now what do I do? So I guess that's how I feel. And <laughs> Definitely have time for one more question. I'm happy to hear it. You know, I'm a teacher, so I just wait. Uh, thank you for the presentation, which is very um, educational to me. So I just get the very interesting discussion from a, a Chinese um, conference uh, in China, which is talking about the education, uh, the future of education. And this is a very interesting concept. It's talking about when the uh, um, fragment, fragmented learning uh, um, age is coming, um, they're thinking of fragmented teaching. So the, the, the idea is about a teacher, they don't need to know everything about one specific subject. For example, like a math teacher, you don't have to know any everything about math. You just know a certain point of, certain kind of uh, period of math and you get really deep into it. And you just teach your student this specific period. Another period, they will have other teachers to teach that. Um, which makes me think of teacher's role in the technology age. So uh, what do you think of a teacher's role, teacher's role in this, uh, like this time we were talking about so many uh, technologies and how they influence teaching? Thank you. Um, well, the teacher's role, personally, from my, I mean, I'm not a teacher, but um, the way I feel as a student, when I look at my teachers, I see mentors um, and friends even, because the the challenges of of going through post secondary education and even elementary, they they're pretty strong. We've all experienced them. Uh, life happens, and having a good teacher can be the deciding factor. Uh, so that's how I look at my teachers, friends and mentors, and and people who just guide me. And with what you described, what uh, that was discussed in the conference uh, in China, I, I think it's it's an interesting way to look at it. Uh, but personally, I think I would struggle because it would be difficult to uh, build that bond with a with a teacher because uh, I only see them once in I don't know how long, it would be very difficult to build that bond and it can also be disconnecting in the classroom. That's what I think, I don't know. I haven't done any studies, but that's my opinion. Mm, I think that there is a lot to learn from everybody. Um, teachers definitely hold a wealth of knowledge in a particular area and it's interesting that you mentioned this sort of fragmentation of learning and teaching because during my thesis project, I sort of looked at technology and education and I think it's interesting that you know you can see the concept of blockchain combining with like, op like open education and badging and potentially lead to a more decentralized and distributed education where you're not going to one school and learning one thing and you know if you decide that you don't like that or you need to leave the school you've dropped out or failed you're just fragmenting your education and going somewhere else to learn and you're learning your whole life not just for four years 
And then that, I think, at the same time, everybody, teachers, everybody that has experience, can use technology to share their knowledge online and really accelerate everybody's learning. Yeah. I think also with this um, dissemination of information and how we absorb information these days, um, a really important part is to focus on um, not necessarily the expert content, but the soft skills that you learn from your educational experience. Um, and part of it is, you know, having a teacher as a mentor, having a teacher as a friend, and in that relationship, you learn things about how to self-advocate. You learn about what's important to you. You learn more about your own values. Um, and so I think if um, this model, if it's able to retain that relational um, experience, then it could work very well because then you would have um, very targeted expert content knowledge people who um, can, you know, um, can focus on what they know to teach, but um, the important thing is um, can they maintain that relational um, uh, benefit also? Well, I hope you'll just join me in thanking the students for an absolutely um, illuminating panel. Uh, so let's give them a round of applause and then <laughs> we'll stay. But before you go anywhere, I know there's a few other things that we're going to take care of right now, so. Get one more round of applause for these students. Exceptional. <laughs> so, really quickly, four quick updates. Firstly, I want to remind everyone that we are entering the last block of concurrent sessions. I want to also remind everyone that at 3:45, Dr. David Porter, CEO of OE Campus Ontario, is going to be here with closing remarks. Thirdly, what was the third advertisement? Ah, right, we've been asking all of you to fill out your inspirational cards. So very shortly, we're gonna be awarding individuals who you have indicated have been inspirational for you. Last update, 